I just think this is a market that will catch people by surprise. It's down at a level now where technically and fundamentally, the risk seems to be 10% or more to the downside, but at least three to five times more of that or more over time to the upside. And that's why I've taken and made the bets that I've made. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And with us today, a new guest, Peter Grandich from Peter Grandich and Company. Peter, thank you so so much for joining us today. Very much to be with you. We're gonna enjoy it, I'm sure. Well, it's great to have you. And what I first wanted to discuss is that you recently publicly announced that you are 100% in on gold, silver, uranium, and copper. Can you expand on what makes you so bullish right now? Well, first of all, uh, you have to describe it as a riverboat gambler. Now, Wall Street created the word speculating, so he doesn't have to say gambling, but gambling and speculating is the same thing. You have to be prepared to lose part of all your capital. For me, uh, I had spent a lot of years, almost 25, working within the metals and mining industry as one of my two livelihoods. But in 2013, I left. And I didn't really look at gold until 2018 and found it so compelling that I uh, did the same thing, but basically just with gold and gold mining chairs. Now, uh, I find myself, as you and I speak, uh, 100% long, just things related to gold, silver, copper, and uranium. I own no general equities or bonds. I felt last year, I stated around this time that between our Labor Day and New Year's, I wouldn't want to own general equities or bonds any of them. And I don't. Uh, and of course, because of the uh, everything bubble, uh, unfortunately, uh, the metals have been caught in it. I don't think it's so much people don't have a bullish case for them anymore. I think it's been a sell first, ask questions later due to uh, the literally overnight like change of attitude to both by the Fed and uh, the powers that be. And so I I think the metals got down to a level as you and I speak to where they offer, if you can look past your nose, which for some investors is hard to do these days. You know, when I started in the business almost 40 years ago, research reports had three to five year outlooks. If you talk to somebody about the next three to five years, they think you're crazy, right? I can't wait that long. But I think if you have an attitude past this year, looking into 20 and 23 and beyond, as I said in that, post that you refer to, I think a year from now, when we look back, we're going to go, wow, I can't believe they were giving those prices away at those levels. Certainly that's the bet that I've made. So it seems like you're looking, you know, at least a year uh, or two down the road, which, you know, I mean, I know you've mentioned this before that that's what everyone used to do in the the old days. Right. And that that's what I think people should be doing, maybe not t- paying attention day to day. Right. Um, but if we do look for the short term and people are looking to, you know, buy the dip buy the bottom, do you see further downside in the metals or do you think this is it? So. Today in my in the post that you referred to, I, I put out some charts. Now, I'm not a technician, meaning I don't just trade because technical analysis as something. Many times they become self-fulfilling prophecy simply. If people focus enough on a price and it hits it, then everybody acts because the chart claims it's supposed to. But I do look at it when I'm looking to make major decision by ourselves. And so I put up the four charts. The easy one was uranium. That story is it's the most classic bullish story one could look for. So we'll We'll pass that for a moment if you'd like to get back to it. But I think the one that should be of most interest probably to your listeners is the gold market. And and if we can get past owning mining shares, a lot of times people that own gold also own mining shares. And when mining shares don't go well, they kind of blame the gold price for it. But gold realistically uh, has been traded in a very wide range, 16, 15, 1700 maybe a short-term low for a day or two in that area. And the 2000 area, you know, for a very short time is the high. And we've just been in that range. And uh, 
the fact that we're back towards the bottom of the range with an argument of, I think there's a reason, if you like to discuss it more, that the dollar is soon about to actually peak. And a huge event that's not getting really any coverage anymore that I think a lot of people are going to be talking about before too long, and that is the BRIC nations getting stronger, larger, and introducing their own currency. And that's going to be uh, bad for the, the U.S. dollar. So silver always, I know people get upset because retail people like to own quantity versus quality. They write to buy 10,000 shares of a dollar stock then 1,000 shares of a $10 stock. And sometimes that's how they look at silver versus gold. But I think it's behind gold. I want to own gold first, but I think silver will rise. And then the market that's been completely oversold due for at least a major bounce. And I think the story and argument a few months ago about it for what was going to happen for years out has only been delayed, not changed, and that's copper. So that's why I, between those four, I found enough stocks that I felt that uh, were worthy to own. And of course, owning the physical metals where you can are those obviously gold and silver, I, I think are really important. And you need to do that first, even before you look at the shares. Now, you mentioned that you look at, uh, you're more bullish right now on gold versus silver because of gold's monetary uh, central banks are looking at gold as a monetary metal, it seems like. Um, now, a lot of people are looking more at more than just at the quantity they can own for silver, but also looking at the gold silver ratio being about 90 to one historically high your perspective on that. Cause some people's uh, thesis or some people's uh, idea is that own silver right now until the ratio goes down and then swap into gold. But your perspective, why are you at the moment more bullish on gold? Well, I, I would just caution people to this and I'm not saying that they're not right, but, Tools that were used for markets 20, 30, 40 years ago may not be as effective or may be outdated because the markets have changed so dramatically. I'll give you just an example of the general equity market. When I entered the business, 90% of the trading was the general public. I doubt 10% is that now. So the gold silver ratio, uh, I think, had more validity years ago, but the markets that make them up and why they move certain ways have changed. And so I don't believe you can keep using that same ratio, so to speak. And there's always been an argument, what is the right ratio and all? And that's always just the opinion of someone looking at it. What I think the mistake would be is, is to be overweighted dramatically in one versus the other. If you said to me, Pete, if, if you could have 50-50, would that be happy? Yeah, I'm satisfied with that. If one goes up a little bit more than the other one, fine. I, I don't think one's going to go up without the other one going. So it's not something like you're going to miss the boat if you emphasize one versus the other. But the ratio thing I, I've kind of put on the back shelf because I just don't think it's as qualified anymore because so many things have changed to make up what should be the so-called right ratio. And could you expand on some of those things that have changed that really possibly make the ratio ir irrelevant right now? Well, I, first of all, I, and there's a good argument of how much more is industrial use for one versus the other. Uh, how much, look, central banks have been, you know, the, the secret in all this, and I think when, if we're correct for those of us that are bullish on gold, all three or four of us, because on Wall Street, it's just a natural tendency not to be bullish. It's like kryptonite gold to a lot of the general people on Wall Street. But for those who can be independent and also not just totally caught up and always think you have that, you know, gold is going to go through the roof. I think you have to look at why have central banks, given everything that we know that they've been doing in the paper markets and what they've been doing with interest rates, why have they continued to be significant large buyers of gold, particularly China and Russia? And I think that goes to what my feeling is. Last week, the BRICS met. Not only are they inviting new countries in, including possibly the Saudis, but they publicly spoke. Putin actually made a public statement along with Chinese officials how they're about to start trading away from the dollar without getting Pacific. But yet you had to be stupid not to talk, think that they were not talking about a different currency, whether they're going to adopt the yen or they're going to introduce a new one. So I, I, I think things like that make up a difference on what could happen here. And that's why I think we can't use things from 30 or 40 years ago anymore, including whether you're looking at general equities or bonds as well. 
And if we could expand on on this move away from the dollar, because it seems like we are definitely seeing that, especially uh, after the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, there has been countries moving away from the U.S. dollar. And as you mentioned, the BRICS nations are looking to develop um, their a new reserve currency. Um, so can you expand on how that is going to impact people in the U.S.? Will it uh, bring dollars back to the U.S. and cause more inflation? Your take. Yeah, well, first of all, we've seen already the IMF has reported that since 1999, ownership of the U.S. dollar has gone from about 70 percent to 59 percent, I think is the number. So we've seen that slow but steady move away from that into the dollar. I think what the war did, it, it really spooked even allies, not just because of how we left Afghanistan, but that we would suddenly do what we did in terms of banking and freezing and all this other stuff. And it would make countries, many of which aren't exactly our best allies, think, hey, what would stop them from doing that to us? And if they did that to us, what what could happen? Should we start thinking about something away from them? And, you know, listen, whether you like it or not, and this is hard for people because they don't like the thought, but China is moving towards, if not there already or, or surpassing, to rivaling the U.S. as the world economic power and militarily. I mean, just it's a fact of life. People don't want to deal with it. So why wouldn't you would want to think if you didn't have some natural prejudice or tendency to think that maybe something that they're involved with or something that revolves around their selves? Look at today as you and I speak, markets rallied in some of the commodities, especially copper, simply because China spoke of an easing not the US, China. And so I I think that's another factor. And, you know, why have they been such accumulators along with Russia and getting rid of US financial assets, particularly treasury bonds? So there's a there's a there's a stealth bullish factors adding up for gold. And while the general financial media is never going to talk positive about it, they're just not. Their hips are tied to the major brokerage firms and the people who advertise with them. And those folks cannot solicit or be high on gold at the same time telling you to buy stocks and bonds. So I just think this is a market that will catch people by surprise. It's down at a level now where technically and fundamentally, the risk seems to be 10% or more to the downside, but at least three to five times more of that or more over time to the upside. And that's why I've taken and made the bets that I've made. And it does seem like even sentiment right now is is down in the dumps for precious metals. I mean, you've mentioned this definitely on your blog. Well, I use a chart and it's a a gentleman, it's the single best graph I've ever found in my career. I I only wish I discovered it and recognized what he was trying to say in it 20 years ago. I would have a lot more money than I have now. But uh, it really goes through the psyche. And the psyche at the top is euphoria. We're all just can't miss. Then there's slight pullbacks as it starts to turn down and people. And then it gets to the opposite. End, and that's where gold and things like mining shares are at. Depression and despondency. And this most recent decline even brought despondency into what would be called or what the few that I still follow and remember from my days of being in the business, so-called gold bugs, people that are always bullish on it always talking about it. Even they were hanging their heads low and, you know, on social media and trying to change the subject and showing memes and all about how they're getting beaten up. That psyche is the exact opposite of where cryptocurrencies were a year ago, where everybody, you know, had these guys out there. I mean, horrendously terrible things that people were thrown in jail for in the 80s or 90s with penny stock, saying you should sell everything you own, stocks, bonds, homes, Borrow if you have to and put it all just in Bitcoin, not even across the cryptocurrency board. That type of mentality is always seen for what I call them the tulip mania of the 21st century. And now we see the opposite of that in the gold and silver and the mining share market. It's just it's really I mean, I could even tell by today by this blog that you know I put out. My clients and people that know me for a long time that would normally say, hey, I'm with you, are going, Pete, I don't think so. I think this time it's really bad. Blah. That mood, I just have to take the other side on. It's just, it, you know, I don't know if there's still a true contrarianism anymore, but if there is, I think this is a gold and silver and, and copper and, you know, uranium are 
get contrary the, the ultimate contrarian buys right now. And it definitely, if you can weather the storm, I mean, as you mentioned, it is a gamble, but you know, with a sentiment so, so negative right now, it seems like we could be approaching a bottom here, but I did want to uh, touch on also the stock market because it does seem like, you know, a lot of people out there are just saying, you know, buy the dip as well here, but are we going lower? Do you think in the stock market, is this just the beginning of a crash? So one of the key factors that got me to where I didn't want to own general equities or bonds, and if anybody wanted to listen this time last year, going into the end of the year, was this fact. Two-thirds of the people giving financial advice, licensed financial advisors in the U.S., were in the business before the last financial crisis. That's when they started. And less than 25% were in the business before the new millennium started. So my argument back then is, is as crucial now, to answer your question, if just give me a second to explain, is they didn't experience what a down market was. They didn't have an idea that it's not a one-way street. You do eventually get to two-way traffic or go off a bit of traffic circle. And when they did, we were gonna see what we saw. Well, that's the same now. That same group, which is in, in existence, they are used to, like you said, Markets go down, it doesn't stay long, you buy the dip, and we go back up, okay? If we don't go back up, and I think there's fundamental reasons, we can discuss it if you like, why we won't, and even we just go sideways, that group is not prepared, nor are the typical people that are following them, to be in, a, in an environment like that. And that's when I think the big part of what I call the chop and steady erosion that I see for the stock market going forward comes because over half the funds in the US markets now are in passive funds. They're not being actively managed. They're in funds that are basically tracking an index and all. And when the market was going up, it was very easy. It just went up, I had look at my statement, I'm making more money. But now if the public that owns most of that or institutional pension funds, whatever, start to see declines and not make up those declines and go to sell. There's no middle person who can say, oh, wait a second, sell something, but don't sell this group or that because this." now they just have to sell without asking questions. And as great as that was going up, it's going to be an accelerated to the downside. We haven't gotten there yet. I still think there's a reasonable chance we're going to get there. And that's why I wouldn't commit back to the general equity market yet. And that, along with a whole lot of political and social events that you and I could spend hours talking about that are very negative for this country, uh, is why I still don't feel the general equity market is going to be a place. And let me tell you this, there's a recession, whether it's here at the moment and we'll be able to look back and say, wow, it was or it's a few months from now. But two things are going to happen and they're much different than before. One we're gonna see profit margins drop. Businesses are just not gonna be able to make the profits they have. And we haven't seen the analytical community start to downgrade their future expectations of earnings for companies. We're gonna still have to go through that. And liquidity. This was a market because the Fed created this monetary heroin that everybody, almost everybody got hooked on, investors as well as corporations. They just can't afford to keep doing that. They have to make an attempt because inflation is really out of control. It's much higher than what the government numbers say. And while demand destruction can happen to help lower that level, the difference in this time than when they compared, oh, when Volcker went up and this and that, is we have a lot of inflation because of supply constraints. No one was thinking when we said to do lockdowns and all that, if we stop building stuff or end or we discovered for the first time in the pandemic that a lot of stuff we need is not made here. It's made somewhere else and it's made by not exactly the best of friends. So there are a lot of things still to have to outplay that. And we've had the destruction in the stocks and bonds. We've seen that bubble burst. We've seen it in cryptocurrencies. But the last market is the real estate market, and that's just starting to unfold now. In these coming months, I believe we're going to see, you know, declines. And once that happens, here's the thing that will be talked about for 2023 going forward by the so-called financial media, the wealth effect. Look how many people have just pulled back because they just recognize after all this that's happened, I'm not in any way great shape. 
I'm not, I've been living beyond my means, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to look at 60% of the public uh, lives paycheck to paycheck. Uh, 46% only have a thousand saved for emergencies. The average person's retirement savings is only 71,000. Are you going to be able to retire on 71,000? There's a whole bunch of things that have been covered up during this craziness uh, of the era that we went through in this. There's a price to pay for it. So I find it very difficult, if not impossible, to want to take any type of exposure to general equities at this point in time. I just think the market may not go down as much. Certainly, the, you know, we got stocks that were touted a year ago as, you know, at 200 and now trading at 20. I mean, those, you know, it's tremendous losses. The cryptocurrencies, two thirds of the wealth of that has disappeared in a year. You cannot see wealth like that go away and not expect a consumer driven economy to be uh, hit hard. And so that's why I still think there's no argument about a recession. It's only whether it's going to be how severe it's going to be. And I know data from the Atlanta Fed is already showing, uh, you know, the live GDP is showing us in a recession right now. Um, you mentioned shortages, and it seems like with the Russia-Ukraine war and the sanctions following that, that has just made the issue worse. Um, can you expand on why you see it getting worse from here? Well, first of all, uh, we have uh, allowed ourselves to buy into a story that Years ago, when I was younger and active in the money management business, we must have attended, I don't know how many seminars and how many folks walked into the brokerage firm to tell us about globalization and how the world is going to be better off. We're going to be one big economy, people that weren't around. And that was a huge selling point. Globalization is dead. We, we've seen that now. And part of the reason it's dead is you got rid of the idea of storage, we have, we'll have we we'll store stuff we don't need in public storage that our parents and grandparents never needed, but we don't store anything more for, for a rainy day or for, we got rid of everything that was distributor. If there was hardware, we used to have hardware distributors. If there was food, we had food. Now it's everything is just in time. Well, that was great. It lowered cost and certain companies made a lot of money, but then we realized as soon as there's a hiccup in it and the pandemic was the the hiccup, uh, it doesn't work. And now we found that during that globalization, we left our dependence on a lot of important things, strategic metals, medical prescription stuff, that nature, to literally people that have openly stated or quietly stated, they're either not the best of friends or that they're, they're, they're our enemies. And so that isn't going to improve. And that's coming at a time, by the way, when the political environment here in the U.S. is only going to get worse. This is, I have called, you know, a year ago, people didn't want to hear it, but a lot of people at least willing to hear it, even though they don't like to accept it. I don't believe other than the Civil War, America has been more divided socially and politically. And that has super ramifications economically as well. And if the Democrats are to lose, as people are predicting, They've been pretty bad sore winners. They haven't been happy being sore winners because they haven't gotten what the hard left believes is right for the country done. What are they going to be like as sore losers? So I just think anybody that thinks politically come November and one group goes out, another one comes in, we return to happier days. I don't think so. And I think after all of that and everybody takes a breath and whatever the political group that's in control we're going to realize that we haven't been in a position like this perhaps since America's Civil War. And that's why, again, I have big problems on being bullish on the economy. And if you're not bullish on the economy, no matter what some 22-year-old financial advisor tells you, it's hard to be bullish on general equities. And I know a lot of our viewers are concerned about the economy and they're concerned about the supply issues going forward. And as you mentioned, just the divided country. In your perspective, what are some ways we can prepare for the, the troubles ahead, but also remain, you know, with a uh, remain constructive, right? And building a better world uh, going forward. So in this real latter part of my career, which could probably be measured in months, if not a couple of years, if the good Lord allows me to live it. Uh, I really am outspoken, and I hope you don't mind, in my Catholic Christian faith. 
It is uh, something that I've built what remains of my business on. In fact, I once had a very lucrative sports-related business dealing with athletes from a financial standpoint, but because we're professional athletes and teams have gone, uh, it conflicted greatly with my faith, and I had to leave that lucrative business uh, and not be a hypocrite by staying. So for me, I look at everything from the foundation of, of a good book. Now, that book can either be viewed as I do as the word of God or just an historically book for some reason people read for 2,000 years while they tossed others out, but they keep this one around. And there's been several different editions and, you know, a couple of different fates have, you know, taken parts of it and all. But whether or not the author or authors and whether or not they were godly inspired or just human beings doing whatever the reason they did it for, they put some really good financial advice in that book. In fact, there's more matters of finance in that book than there is about heaven or hell. And one of the things that's stressed in that book throughout is debt is not a good thing. And there's not a positive verse in the Holy Bible about debt. So I've been on this kick for years and I, and I incorporated into my work that not only to try to be debt free, but less is more. Despite the blessings of wealth increase in our family and life, we've lessened our ownership of things. Uh, we're called upon, as you said, uh, you know, what is things happening? We we witness in my family, and I think this is important to answer your question. If you do any work with people at work in food banks or assisting working class people now, it is tenfold worse than it was just a couple of years ago. Yes, the pandemic contributed that, but to, even after the pandemic kind of getting behind us here, it is harder and harder for more and more people to go forward. And what's coming because of you and I have just point to and touched on from economics is only going to make it more 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 difficult. So I don't want to own gold because I'm preparing for the end of the world and I'll be able to get a loaf of bread when someone can't. I'm not looking to get a cabin in the woods or buying survivor stuff and all. That's people, that's their individual choices and all. First of all, I don't believe my faith calls me to do that. My faith actually calls me to take more of whatever I have to help more people that I can have. But I do think that there will be, in a sense, an unwinding of the Band-Aid that has been over America economically, socially, and politically, and it's quite ugly. It's, it's, it's very ugly, and, it, and it's raw. And uh, at a time when what the country used to be built on, a Judeo-Christian way of life, is moving more and more away from, it's certainly becoming more secular. Whether socialism is in its future, you know, people can have discussions about that. So there's a lot, a lot of moving parts. And that's why I just say you err on the side of caution. I have an old saying. People know me. I've said it long before I turned as bearish as I am now. And it's better to be a live chicken than a dead duck. And so that's the approach, I think. Let's hope guys like me are wrong. You know, I've heard last year this a lot from close friends and friends. Strangers, you know, Pete, I know you're right, but I hope you're wrong. Well, hope is a wonderful, it's the best spiritual strategy, but it's a horrible investment strategy. You have to prepare, as you say, and all. So I think, like I said, I, I, if someone said to me, what's typical, uh, I think you want to own what people don't. Well, nothing fits that criteria better right now than gold and silver. That, that's, that's, that's a gimme. Is it time yet to be involved in the stock market? No, I think there's more pain to have to go through. And I rather let it go through and clearly be on the uptrend and miss the first whatever percentage, but it's clear the worst is behind us. And then I just think you have to lead, lead a life with some meaningful purpose and not some celebrity or TV anchor person and all, but hopefully a, a, a spiritual belief that there's more to this than that. People ask me if I, I hope I'm not going on too long, but let me just say this. They ask me, well, Pete, what if you're wrong about all this stuff? What if you just go, Pff. my answer always is it's still a better way to live. So many words of wisdom right there. And I think what you mentioned at the beginning there about uh, debt is so interesting. And I, I was reading an article on your blog about debt and how, how the Bible talks about it. And one of the, one of the points that I found was so interesting was, um, it's almost as if like debt is procrastination in a sense. It's like if we build our life on debt and the country is building itself on debt where we have a debt based monetary system, it's like 
you're failing every single day to pick up the cross in a sense. It's like you're putting that off to the next day. Um, could you speak on that and how how should that how should people use debt or not use debt in their daily life? Well, I, I don't first of all, I think it's very important to understand that when people talk about our debt, to understand how severe it is and how to what level. And let, let's talk a couple key points. First of all, our hard debt, which the government clearly owes borrowed against has debt issued out there, and I'm talking just on the federal level, is getting close to 31 trillion now. When I entered the business way back in the dinosaur era of 1984, we were the world's largest creditor nation. So just that change alone, okay, is significant. But people talk about interest rates having to go back maybe near what inflation is likely to be. I hear the number four or five percent taught out. And really, if you're going to conquest, you're going to conquer inflation. Real interest rates have to get above the inflation rate. So if inflation is five, you're going to have to see interest rates at six. But let's just use five percent. Well, five percent on thirty one trillion dollars is one point five trillion in interest expense. America's greatest year of income, tax income, that's all America lives off of, was $3.3 about $3 trillion in 2019. We're going to pay half of all our income just to pay the interest on our debt. That doesn't leave a dollar for principal payment or any other bill, military or whatever. It's That's not sustainable. It can't, it, it can't be done. So those arguments of people that say, hey, the Fed is soon going to have to cave in and drive down interest rates, that's an argument based on that being a possibility. But even more so, the debt is not just on the federal level. It's in companies. The pandemic, the Fed literally created trillions of dollars that they out of thin air and bought assets, mainly from assets of companies that were better to have folded or would have folded without that and will still fold even with that. And then we look at the state and local levels, and then we look at personal debt. Uh, you know, people have been getting by these last couple of months due to the high energy cost by putting it on their credit cards. Well, you can only do that for so long till you, you reach a credit limit. So this whole thing is what the, the author or authors, obviously for us, I believe, almighty God, uh, said in the Bible and why they were so adamant about it. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have a mortgage for a house you can afford. It's not to say I don't want people to ever think that that you don't even do that. But having reasonable debt based on a clear ability to pay it and provide your family a suitable place to live is a worthy thing. So their debt is good. But where debt is not good is when I when you read stories where people earning $250,000 or more are living paycheck to paycheck. Why is that? Because Obviously, people making one third of that are managing to, to live it's because they're living with things that the world has told them or things going to make them happier. They'll always sell you the world that the bus driver can never be as happy as the guy that owns the bus company. But some of the happiest people, especially if you ever did missionary work and all, are people with little or no money. So there's this whole false facade that more money equals more happiness. You just have to watch financial commercials. That's what most of the firms are basically saying in their messages and so forth. So I really think the way you prepare for this and all this is to take a less is more attitude. Most people can survive and survive reasonably well with less than they have now. Now, some people can't, but most can. And realistically, we're not only called to do that, but tithing, which is a very difficult thing for many to do. My Protestant brethren tend to tithe much better than my Catholic brethren. And, uh, but tithing is something that when people say to me, Pete, what, what turned it around for you? Because, you know, I hit some pretty bad lows. I've lost millions, not once, but twice. Now, I know that's hard for people to believe that people in the financial service industry lose money, but it actually happens now and then. And in that, I had a sense of no longer uh, me, myself, and I, that there was more to life 
And uh, I became a great tither, even when I didn't have the finances that I had. And I just watch things turn around and I hear so many stories. And tithing doesn't have to be just in cash. Tithing could be time. There's a lot of people that need a lot of help. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of places you can volunteer your help, help things, get people. To, you know, I live in a 55 and old community. There's a group here that just makes sure everybody gets their doctors. Apart. There's a lot of good things. So there's a lot of things that aren't in the day-to-day -day financial advisory uh, that wouldn't even be dared to speak about. If I may tell you this, when I originally came up with the concept of my sports business, uh, it was Christian-based. My, my partner was a former running back on the Giant, New York Giants. And when I went to the company that my doing my brokerage business through at the time, they said, listen, you could put a rock on the door, you can put a bull on the door, but you're not putting Jesus on the door. So you're never going to get that tide of Christian faith into, into the financial world. In fact, they frown upon it. And, uh, you know, to talk about that, that doesn't say that there's good people within the financial service industry living of faith. And there are an odd company that puts, you know, puts God on the door. But so I, I think that one of the first things I tell people, especially if they have a Christian background, whether they say they're Catholic, but they haven't been to church in 20, 30 years, is go to that bookshelf, get that book that has got a lot of dust on it, blow it off, and then open up and read it as a financial book. And even if you don't do that, go online and ask, and ask Google, where in the book is there about things related to finance? And you'll just be amazed of, of how much great teachings there are there. And that's what I try to live off of. And uh, I fail, I fall, I'm a, you, you know, I'm a failed human nature that was only saved at the cross. So, and I make mistakes. I have stocks that are blown up here that I never thought would be this low. But uh, I, and, and speaking to you, you giving me this chance to share this is not something that would be common. And what I'm grateful for is I, I, I'd be as honest and put the life of my daughter. I'd sooner speak to you about this than be on CNBC TV right now talking about, you know, the gold market or something like that nature. So I hope somebody benefits from what you and I just got to share. Well, I definitely hope so too. And we really appreciate you sharing all that. The Catholic faith is very important to me as I see it is for you. So we really appreciate that. Um, and what I'd like to have a, a, you share now is if you could share with our viewers where they can find you if they are interested in really putting faith and finances together, uh, where they can find you. PeterGranich.com is really the only way I communicate now. I have a blog. I do an occasional video on a YouTube channel, but it's always put in a blog post. And then I do occasional podcasts and interviews like, like yourself. I would, because of how gracious you've been allowed me to share our faith, I would point uh, viewers that under resources link, there are some booklets that I've written about tying faith and money. Uh, my book is about that. And also uh, there's three or four different booklets there that they can read. And it's all you can read it right online. You don't even have to sign up or give an email and all you can just read it from the line. And so I would encourage them to do that. To me, uh, that's far more important right now than them following me in on some crazy stock idea of mine. So I, I hope they I hope someone out there finds that worthy and took the time to go there and look at it. I think they'll be blessed if they do. All right. Once again, Peter, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Thank you so much and God bless. Well, bless you and, 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 and courageous in this day and age where more and more people will be in silent Christian faith to be willing to speak about our Lord and, and have someone on as a guest. Uh, I tell you, anytime you need me for anything, I'll be back because you have that willingness to do that, sir. Thank you. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, 
and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.